Welcome to the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. It's a real delight to have you with us today. Uh, I have a very special guest uh, with us today that I'll introduce in a few minutes. Um, but welcome to everybody, wherever you're joining from, um, whether it's here in the United States or, or around the world. At our school, the Grazia Business School, we're focused on developing best for the world leaders, uh, leaders who take business decisions with an ethical and responsibility oriented framework in mind, yet conduct their business in an innovative uh, manner as well. Um, and so we wanna just share a few thoughts today around a really important topic, the global economy. Um, I'm delighted to be able to represent the faculty of our business school as well today. They publish in some of the most celebrated academic uh, journals as well as uh, executive journals. Um, and I'm really pleased that, Paul, you've been able to join us today. So welcome. Thank you very much indeed. So Paul uh, Donovan, he's the Chief Economist uh, at UBS Global Wealth Management. Uh, Paul has served as a really prominent leader at that organization for some 28 years now. Uh, for those of you that don't know, UBS is a multi-billion dollar global investment bank. Uh, and financial services company. I think it's the largest actually in the world in its uh, sector. Uh, and as the chief economist, Paul is responsible uh, for developing and presenting UBS's economic outlook, uh, the marketing of the UBS view uh, on economics, on policy and political related matters. Uh, he self describes himself as uh, doing economics without jargon, which we highly appreciate. Uh, and Paul is a subject matter expert and author. He recently published a book called Profit and Prejudice, the Luddites of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that uh, later this morning. Uh, Paul has an MA in philosophy, politics and economics from Oxford University and an MSc in financial economics from the University of London. So welcome, Paul. Thank you. Before we get into the meat of our topic uh, this morning, Paul, and thank you for joining from the UK. It's already early evening there. So we really appreciate you eating into your evening time. Um, but tell us a little bit, Paul, what was the inspiration uh, for uh, forging a career in, in global economics? Was it a, a professor, a family member, or just serendipity? <laughs> Um, so it, it was more of an accident than anything else, to be honest. Um, I, I wasn't going to be an economist. I was going to write a, a world uh, beating thesis on uh, Japanese political developments. That's what I wanted to do when I left Oxford. Um, there was just one problem with my, my writing a, you know, a, a massively insightful piece on, on Japanese political developments. Um, I didn't speak Japanese. So um, I got a job. Uh, as a Japanese economist at uh, uh, UBS um, with the intention of going out to Japan and, and having the bank pay me to, to teach Japanese. Uh, and um, then I sort of got sucked into the economics. Um, and the economics of Japan was, was far more interesting than the politics at that time. Um, and then I was offered a job um, uh, as a research assistant to the, to the then chief economist, George Magnus. Uh, George fascinating economist, fantastic economist, still uh, writing and, uh, as an academic economist these days. And um, working with him, I just sort of got sucked into the economics. And uh, you know, all of a sudden woke up 28 years later and thought, I, gee, I never did go back and write that thesis. So um, it, was, it was an accident of history, I suppose, but uh, a mixture of Really, I've always been interested in economics, but it really the, the political economics and the, the policy. I mean, it's just a fascinating subject. And particularly over the last three decades, I've been very fortunate that we've had some some fantastic innovations, some fantastic structural changes, which from you know an abstract economic point of view have been really exciting, frankly. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that, Paul. OK, so let's start with um, the global economy. Um, you know, last year, not a very good year, uh, the global economy, you know, uh, contracted, uh, the US, uh, you know, declined by around three and a half percent, Europe, I think around six to seven percent, globally 3.7 percent. 
China, though, the only economy that actually, um, major economy that grew. And now we're into the first quarter of 2021, and we're seeing an extraordinary growth level from China, 18.3%, US just under around 8%. So is there a real recovery here underway? What are your thoughts on that? So it's, it's an interesting issue about semantics uh, and economists get quite passionate about language from time to time. Um, I don't think we had a, have a recovery because I don't think we had a recession. Um, the problem is when you say recession or recession recovery cycle, everyone's sort of got a, a mental image about what that is. And what happened last year wasn't a recession in that sense. And so what we're having now is not a recovery in the normal cyclical economic sense. So, I mean, so let's think about what happened last year. So for somebody in my position, my contribution to global GDP didn't change last year, probably went up slightly. Um, you know, okay, I'm not you know, flying around the world um, and staying in cheap hotels in various far-flung locations. I'm working from home. But other than that, you know, my job didn't change. My economic output didn't change. Um, so you've got swathes of the economy where actually nothing really changed. Global manufacturing, not nearly as important as it used to be, but global manufacturing didn't have a sort of a recession recovery cycle. Global manufacturing had the equivalent of France's Grand Vacances. As I'm sure you know, the French you know, all stop working for a couple of months every year in the summer. Well, basically, that's what global manufacturing did. Everybody stops working, then everybody started working again. It was a very binary situation. Um, and so what that has done is create not a recovery. We're not sort of grinding back to normal. What we've had is a bounce back. You, you turned everything off and you're turning it back on again. And so after a big loss of GDP, we're now reverting to normal. Um, but there are lots of aspects of the current phase which are unusual. Um, one aspect, of course, is that although we lost a lot of GDP, we didn't lose a lot of capacity. We didn't see businesses closing because you know, governments made sure businesses didn't close. So rather than a, a recovery where you've got to sort of build up your capacity again, the capacity is all there, ready and, and raring to go. I mean, it may have been covered by a dust sheet for the last 12 months, but you whisk off the dust sheet and off it goes. Another interesting factor, um, and there is far too little attention paid to this in my view in, in uh, the world's media, there has been an absolute explosion of business creation since August last year. I mean, the, the rates of business startups in UK, US, where we, we have weekly data for both these countries, running sort of 30, 40% year over year business creation growth. This is just, I mean, it's unprecedented. And it's not just Anglo-Saxon, I mean, it's France, it's Germany, it's Singapore and, and Japan. And this seems to be individuals who have you know, had more free time than they knew what to do with, literally, whilst, whilst being locked down, suddenly thinking, well, you know, I've, I've been making hand-knitted sweaters for years and forcing them on family and friends as, as Christmas gifts. Why don't I start selling them on eBay? Why don't I start um, selling them on Amazon Marketplace, whatever it is? And so you've, you've had these really dramatic changes. So I think we are seeing a, a very, very peculiar situation. I think the danger is if you think about it as being a recovery, you're going to constantly be surprised by the speed and the force of, of the economic bounce back because it's not a normal recovery. Um, but we're definitely seeing strength come through. And I think it's got further to go. Obviously, we don't carry on like this forever um, because you know, there are limits to capacity in the end. But I think certainly we've, we've got uh, a further period of economic renaissance as we come out of this really peculiar situation. Very interesting perspective. I was reading, uh, I think it was in The Economist uh, earlier this month, and they were talking about in the last recession, you know, five years later, you know, the advanced economy's GDP was only, you know, about a tenth of the pre, for, you know, pre uh, decline forecasts, whereas now we're well ahead of those actually much quicker. So... Uh, well, I, th I think this is part of the problem that a, a lot of economists and also statisticians, because the official statistics keep getting it wrong as well. They keep underestimating growth. Mm -hmm. um, 
you're trying to sort of squeeze the the complexity of what we've been through into this nice standard recession recovery model and it just doesn't fit mm -hmm. and so what you're seeing is that even now if, if i look at the the economic reality versus consensus forecasts growth data is consistently beating expectations and statistical agencies are constantly revising up past data releases mm -hmm because they were using these outdated models which really weren't capturing what was going on. And as they get more data in, they realize that actually their, you know, their, predict their, their, their estimations in, their, in the uh, economic data component were, were just wrong, frankly. And Paul, what about the poorer economies? Uh, there's some deep scars that are being you know, experienced there. Are you seeing a different picture between the you know, China, US, Europe scenario versus some of the developing markets? I think there are more challenges in um, the emerging market complex, uh, frankly, including China. Um, so essentially, if I can be a little bit oversimplistic, what happened was in uh, Europe, US, UK, governments took money away from you and then they gave it back to you. So what you saw was people being told, no, you can't work, you can't open your business, but we will compensate you for that, either with unemployment benefit at a, at a, a, a higher rate in the United States, furlough schemes in Europe and the UK, assistance to companies. And as I said, this kept the companies going. There was no reason for companies to fail. They've got a perfectly sound business model. You know, this is a, a you know, once in a lifetime shock. It's not something you can factor in. So you know, companies shouldn't have been allowed to fail. But what that meant was people had income, but they weren't able to spend it because you, you couldn't leave your house. I couldn't go to the village pub. I couldn't drive my car. I mean, I put um, diesel in my car perhaps once in six months. I mean, you know, this, this was just because I was not able to leave home. So you, you get a period of enforced saving because there's nothing else you can do. And that gives you enormous potential. Consumer firepower is really powerful at the moment. Uh, and that's what's driving the developed economies. If we look at the emerging markets, um, generally speaking, uh, governments took your money away, said, no, you can't work, you can't open your business, but they didn't give it back. And so what you had is uh, across countries, including China, in lockdown, people were drawing down their savings in order to survive. You still had to pay rent, you still had to have food, you still had to heat your house. And so you're drawing down your savings and then you emerge from that, not with additional firepower, but having spent all your savings. And so there's then a, a rush to, to reaccumulate. So China emerges, of course, from lockdown very early, but the domestic side of the Chinese economy doesn't really get going. It's, it's starting to show some signs of life. But consumers' share of GDP in China has fallen because they're not being uh, supported by a pot of savings because the pot of savings was taken down, not boosted up. So that's giving you this divergence. The other thing I think which is significant between emerging and developed markets, in my view, the pandemic has accelerated structural change, the, the fourth industrial revolution. And that's a challenge because a number of emerging markets did really well in the third industrial revolution. You know, they became links in these long, complicated global supply chains. They benefited from outsourcing. You know, that's all third industrial revolution stuff. That model doesn't work anymore in the fourth industrial revolution. But rather than having sort of 10 years to sort of reshape your economy and nudge it in the right direction, we've accelerated a number of these changes. And I think we will continue to see a very rapid pace of change. And that presents a structural challenge to a number of emerging markets, because the political leadership has first got to realize that the thing which has made you so successful over the last 20 years isn't going to work anymore. And then secondly, change that, but at a faster pace than was otherwise going to be the case. And that's going to be, I think, quite a significant challenge over the next decade. Mm, fascinating. I'd like to come back to the structural issues a little later, but let's talk about the USA for a, for a few moments, uh, Paul. Um, even just last night, you know, we, we heard about a new plan, um, America Families Plan, totaling $1.8 trillion. 
Um, but even before that, you know, since the pandemic, as you pointed out, you know, the U.S. has injected, I think it's something nearly like five trillion dollars into the economy, which is about 25 percent of the total GDP. And so now debt is at you know, roughly 28 trillion. Um, should we be alarmed at that level of spending? I mean, is it a good use of money? Well, I think we've got, we've got three distinct fiscal policies that have gone on and are going on. So we have had um, fiscal antidepressants. That's stopping things getting worse. So that's unemployment benefit, for example. That was an antidepressant. That wasn't designed to boost the economy. That was designed to stop the economy from collapsing, supporting those firms. The fact that perfectly sound businesses haven't been forced into bankruptcy by you know, a really weird year has required government spending. I think that's appropriate. Now, with every form of government spending, there's always you know, the example, the case study of something that's gone wrong. There's always the you know, a small instance of corruption or a business that really should have failed but was sort of kept limping on. Yeah, absolutely. But you, you, you can't be finessing this in the middle of a crisis. You, know, you, you go big, you sort it out, and you accept that there is a certain amount of, of inefficiency that is created. So I think that the antidepressant absolutely is, um, is, is exactly what was needed. We then had stimulus. Now, actually, the US has not had a lot of stimulus. Most of what the US has done has been antidepressant. Essentially, the US had, to, uh, under, largely under President Trump, had to, to build a European-style welfare state from scratch. Um, and so in Europe, we didn't have these special budget measures because it's already built into the system. And the US basically you know, adopted a French accent and imported it all uh, relatively quickly. Um, but we did have stimulus, the stimulus checks, fairly obviously. And there's been some other measures of stimulus aspects have come through. So that has helped um, uh, boost the economy. If that were to continue indefinitely, that would be problematic. But again, most of this is you know, the stimulus checks are you know, the checks in the post. That's it. It's it's done. So it's it's not ongoing as a deficit. And then we have the redistribution, uh, which is essentially what was announced overnight. Sometimes these are uh, described as fiscal stimulus plans, but of course they're not. They're tax and spend plans that there is you know, taking away as well as giving here. Now we can argue about the merits of redistribution, but in terms of pumping money into the economy, yes, you're pumping in, but you're also pumping out. So that's not going to have so big an issue on, on the debt. I think what we end up with is a step change in debt. That doesn't worry me. I mean, the debt level is not particularly high by international standards. I mean, the UK, for example, is now looking at a debt to GDP ratio a bit below 100%. But I mean, for most of the last century, our debt GDP ratio was above 100%. Before 1970, debt GDP was significantly above 100% for, for most of that period. Um, you, you can cope with that. It's not an unimaginable amount of debt. It's, it's perfectly manageable. Uh, so that, I think, is, is OK. Where I think there is still a concern in the United States, if you'll forgive an outsider criticizing, um, is that the structure of passing budgets through Congress doesn't lend itself to budget discipline going forwards. So whilst we've got a step increase in debt, and I'm not worried about that, the problem we had before the pandemic, and the problem we still have, is that you know, in order to achieve long-term stability in the debt ratio at whatever level you choose, you could say, okay, we'll, we'll accept 150% of debt GDP, but it's got to stay there. The political structures of the United States don't lend themselves to achieving that because it requires compromise, which Congress seems to be struggling to do a lot of the time. Um, and it requires compromise because ultimately to get to a sustainable debt ratio over the medium term, then the United States needs to tax more and spend less. You can't just do one. You've got to do both. It, this is not negotiable in an economic sense. So that, I think, is the, the slightly troubling aspect. The level of debt, though, doesn't particularly bother me at this stage. Mm -hmm. I suppose you could argue, right, that it's sustainable because interest rates are so low. And as long as we keep growing faster than, you know, than the debt, we should be OK. What are your views on interest rate developments over the coming 12 months? 24 months? 
Well, interest rates, um, uh, the, the, in terms of the longer term interest rates, so the government bond yields, yes, we will see some increase. Um, uh, we're not going to see a dramatic increase. Um, bond yields will be below what an economist would, would call fair value. Uh, so you're in a perfect world where economists run everything. You, uh, the, the, the 10-year bond yield would be, uh, in the States, closer to sort of 35 to 4%. It's going nowhere near that. It'll probably be 2 maybe 2.5% next year. Um, and that's because of, of what we call financial repression. Now, this is, this is something all governments do, and it's a wonderful plan because it's a tax that nobody knows is a tax. Um, because what is happening here, it's, it's basically a tax on savings. That um, if you have money in, uh, in the UK, in a pension fund, for example, or in a bond fund in the United States, that money has to be invested in the bond markets. And regulation sort of forces banks to hold bonds and things like that. And so what that means is savings are being, as it were, forced into the bond market at a lower rate than people in the abstract would wish to accept. And if you're accepting a lower rate, uh, you're subsidizing the government. It's a, it's a tax in a clever disguise. Um, it is incidentally very effective over time at reducing debt to GDP ratios. In 1945, the UK had a debt to GDP ratio of 240% of GDP. And by 1975, that was down to, it was just over 40% of GDP. And that decline was almost entirely due to keeping interest rates very low through financial repression as sort of a hidden tax on saving. So I think that we will see a little bit of an increase in, in long-term rates. That will come about because the Fed will taper. The Fed will scale back its bond buying program. Um, but we're not going back to normal because financial repression will keep um, bond yields relatively low. Sorry, I'd like to comment a little bit about uh, inflation, Paul. I mean, with all this injections into the economy, um, I guess on the one hand, it wouldn't be surprising to see some of the cyclical, you know, components, you know, of inflation build. Uh, we've also had some, you know, supply outages, you know, semiconductors, wood, certain metals. Uh, and up until, you know, COVID, I think techno technology enabled disruption helped to sort of put a lid on inflation. But What's your uh, what's your forecast for uh, the inflation environment? Well, over the second quarter, um, year on year inflation is going to be quite high, and it will probably peak in the states somewhere a little bit above three percent. Um, but this is simply because in the second quarter of last year, the oil price collapsed. Well, negative in some measures and zero on on other measures. Nobody was demanding oil, and the oil price simply collapsed. Um, is this an inflation shock? No, it's not. It's, it, it's a base effect. You, know, you shouldn't worry about inflation uh, based on the fact that the oil market had a problem 12 months ago. That's, it's just not relevant. So what happens when we get through this, this weirdness caused by last year's very low oil price? Well, I think inflation is going to stay relatively subdued. One of the things that I pay quite a lot of attention to is the breadth of price increases. This is important. But remember, inflation is a general increase in prices. One commodity or one product rising in price, that tells you something about that market. Lots of prices rising, that tells you something's gone wrong in the economy. Mm -hmm. And we're not seeing lots of prices rising. Um, you can look at uh, the trimmed mean inflation rate, where you take away the very high price rises and the very low price drops, and you just look at what most prices are doing. Or you can look at the median inflation rate, same sort of effect. Or you can look at the number of items going up in price versus the number of items going down in price. All of them are saying most prices are not changing very much. Most prices are changing 2% a year. And that's been the case actually for a very long time. Um, you've got some weird things going on at the extremes, but most prices aren't changing very much. So uh, that's coming through quite, quite significantly. Um, the other thing I think that is happening is that we're starting to see a shift in spending. So up until very recently in the United States, you were in a position where most people had got income, um, but they couldn't go out and spend on services. You couldn't go out to a restaurant. Uh, you couldn't go out to a bar. 
Um, you know, the pubs only opened in the UK three weeks ago. It was a, it was a moment of national celebration. Um, so you've been constrained on how you go out and spend. Um, but what you can do is go onto Amazon and you know, start putting things in the basket, very easy to do. Um, and so but the fact that people have been able to adapt to online spending has meant that as fear of the virus has fallen, as people have felt a bit more secure about their futures, they have been spending, but they've been spending disproportionately on goods. Normally we spend almost all of our money on services. We've actually shifted to spending a lot of our money on goods temporarily. So we've had a surge in demand for spending on goods. Uh, and that has led to some supply constraints and some bottlenecks. What I think has been interesting about this is not for everything, but for the most part, this hasn't led to price increases. This has led to delays in getting what you want. And of course, the fact that we're all shopping online has facilitated this. Because if you go out to a shop to buy something, if you want to buy a copy of my latest book, for example, you go out to a bookshop, you expect to come out with a copy of that book tucked under your arm. But if you buy from Amazon and it doesn't turn up for a week, I mean, obviously you're very disappointed because you want to read a copy of my book, but it's not turned up for a week, it's Amazon, you touch, you blame UPS or whatever it is. And so you don't get that instant gratification. So the delays are, are perhaps more acceptable at this stage. But what's going to happen, and which we're starting to see already in the States, is as restrictions fall and fall and fall, we are going to see a shift in spending patterns. Because what happens next is once the restrictions reach a certain level, spending must pass the Instagram test. And the Instagram test is people will want to spend money on things they can post about on Instagram because people want to have fun. Mm -hmm. Buying a washing machine is not fun. Mm -hmm. Fun is going out and having drinks with your friends and family and posting about it on Instagram. So that's going to be the shift. Now, the important thing here, of course, is service sector to generalize does not have the long, complicated supply chains the manufacturing sector has. The service sector is about labor. Mm -hmm. And what do we have in abundance at the moment? We've got all these people on furlough schemes over here. You've got all those people who are still unemployed in the United States, you know, around about 8 million Americans so don't have a job now who had a job 12 months ago. They will be brought back in. It makes the recovery more established. But of course, it means that, yes, I've got a surge in demand for services, but I'm also seeing a rise in supply. And if demand and supply are more or less imbalanced, you don't really get that inflation pressure coming through. So I'm not too concerned about inflation. We got the second quarter issue, that's all oil prices, and it's just because of weirdness last year. It's not even because the oil price now is particularly high, it's because it was unusually low last year. So I think that we're going to be seeing um, a, 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 a temporary spike, which will give way to an inflation rate that's probably a little bit higher than it was at the start of the year, but it's not going to be a high inflation story, I don't think. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, thanks for that perspective, Paul. Um, prior to COVID, um, you know, some would say that we were facing some structural challenges, you know, and COVID's just served to maybe accentuate those, put a spotlight on them you know, demographic issues, aging population, um, you know, the need for more women in the economy, uh, greener economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, can you comment on some of those? What's your perspective on the structural issues that pre-existed? So the, the structural issues, the, the, the thing which worries me, as I said earlier on, I think the, the, the um, pandemic has probably accelerated the process of structural change. And that is a little bit troubling because it means governments have to sort of scramble to come up with policies to deal with the structural change. And governments aren't very good at dealing with structural change normally. And if you're accelerating it, that's problematic. So um, if you'll forgive a British example, um, we had this uh, in, in August last year, the British Prime Minister was saying that people really need to go back to the offices start working in offices again, because um, you know, all of these sandwich shops and bars around offices need office workers to supply. In other words, you know, he was expecting me to go back to my office in London in order to save the Pret-a-Manger sandwich chain. Now, admittedly, I do spend a lot of money in the Pret-a-Manger sandwich chain, but actually, it's a lot more efficient for me to be working from home, at least some of the time, 
It means my company is saving on uh, real estate, which is not cheap in London. It's saving on office equipment. Um, you, you don't have unnecessary duplication of resources. I work a lot more efficiently here. I'm not traveling to work. I'm not spending a, you know, a, an hour a day commuting. You know, all of this is a lot more efficient and better for the economy. So you know, rather than sort of the government solution is we're getting all this structural change. Let's try and stop the clock. The solution is for the pret a sandwich chain to change their business model, which they have done because they're a, a pretty good company in my view. Um, so that's the change that you need to get. But the, the risk here is that governments panic in the face of this structural change. So we're getting lots and lots of, of problems here, I think. And, and we need to uh, have governments and companies sort of sit and think rationally, okay, the world has changed. We can't carry on as we have been doing. How do we best adapt? And that's going to take a lot of soul searching. Um, I think that as we go through these structural changes, I mean, they're all quite intimately linked. So a lot of the issues around um, improving efficiency, improving environmental efficiency for sustainable reasons, uh, making um, you know, uh, improved profitability, um, uh, uh, improving the effectiveness of your workforce. This is tied into diversity and inclusion. You need the right person, right job, right time. Irrelevances about you know, their ethnicity, their gender, their sexuality, their you know, language, the color of their hair. I mean, none of that matters. You need to focus on getting right person, right job, right time. And if you get that, you make a more efficient company. You make better use of the structural changes that are coming through. That improves your environmental efficiency. It improves your profitability. That's the, 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 the sweet spot. The problem is with all this upheaval and uncertainty being accelerated, that becomes actually quite difficult to achieve. So that's going to be one of the challenges, I think. Just looking at you know the speech from last night and infrastructure plan, you know, two point three trillion dollars, um, transportation, buildings and utilities, uh, those kinds of things. Um, you know, there's probably going to be some you know pretty good agreement around the need to upgrade some of those things. I, I understand the uh, American Society of Engineers actually think we should be spending two point six trillion dollars, not just the you know. The, the amount that, that was outlined in the plan. And then there's the American Families Plan. But, you know, instead of going for deficit spending, he's going to need to raise taxes. Um, and so it always comes down to who's going to pay, right? And so corporate tax is going up, uh, uh, personal income tax is going up. Uh, any thoughts on that as a strategy uh, for solving this issue? Well, I mean, a lot of this is, is uh, social issues. Um, so, you know, a society decides what level of government it wants to have. Generally speaking, Anglo-Saxon societies prefer smaller government involvement to European societies, for example. Um, that doesn't mean you have zero government involvement, but it, it, it means you have less. But then you have to decide, okay, well, you know, what do we want in terms of equity? There's always a trade-off between you know, opportunity, equality of opportunity and being able to profit from your own personal skills and how do you, you trade off these two things um, and which is the better for society as a whole. Because of some of the structural changes that we're talking about, I think that some of the issues around taxation are shifting. So corporate tax is a good example of this. Um, over the last 30 years, there has been a race to the bottom in terms of global corporate tax, because the model of the last 30 years has been you want to attract a company to make stuff with you and then export to the rest of the world. So if you can be really attractive as a location for a company, pull that company in. Um, once you've got them secured with a low corporate tax rate, you're going to create jobs because they're, they're not making for the local economy, they're making for the world. So um, you, you, Ireland has been particularly adept at doing this within Europe, as has the Netherlands. So that's always been one competition. The thing is that model is no longer working. And in fact, the argument of a race to the bottom in terms of corporate taxes is starting to fade because what we're moving towards is localization of production. If you want to sell something in the United States, you make it in the United States. If you want to sell something in the United Kingdom, you make it in the United Kingdom. Robotics, automation make this a lot more possible. So in that case, 
it's not a K, it's not a question of we, we need to attract a company in so that it will have a big plant here exporting to the world. We're starting to shift a bit um, and saying, actually, you make locally for the local market. Um, if you want to sell to our market, you accept the corporate tax rate. Obviously, there are limits to this. If you've got a corporate tax rate of 60%, you're going to have problems getting anybody selling. But you know, within realistic limits, this race to the bottom, I think, starts to look quite dated. Um, alongside that, I think we're also running into the, you know, the concept of fairness. Um, in at least democratic societies, there is a sense that uh, you know, some large companies have been evading taxes because they've got teams of clever lawyers and accountants, which your average mom and pop store does not have. And that's not fair. You know, everyone should have, uh, you know, every entrepreneur should have an equal opportunity. And I, I agree with that. I think you've got to equalize the opportunity as much as possible. So again, the idea of some kind of equalization on corporate tax, it appeals to fairness, and that's going to be a politically popular theme, I think, for a number of years. To some extent, that does come in as well around issues of income tax and, and so forth. There will be more limits on that, and that's a lot more cultural. It depends on you know, if, if lower income people aspire to being higher income people, or if lower income people envy higher income people. You know, that's that's a, a critical distinction when we're talking about uh, personal tax rates. I think, again, though, there is a there is a concept of fairness here which accepts that higher income people should probably pay somewhat more tax than lower income people. The level then, it's cultural, it's social, and, and it will vary from country to country. Going back to the race to the bottom point that you make, uh, Paul, Yellen recently proposed a sort of a world minimum tax mm. uh, on all businesses. Do you, do you think that could be even possible? What do you think about that initiative? I think it is more possible now than at at any moment in the recent past. So the OECD has been plugging away at this for some time. It's been, a, it's been an objective of the OECD. Um, why is it more possible now? Um, partly the concept of fairness, that um, you can create a very good Twitter meme about tech companies avoiding their obligations by going to tax bolt holes in Ireland, the Caribbean, you know, whatever. Um, and this is the sort of thing that social media latches onto. Um, and that really is, is becoming quite a powerful force politically. The other thing I think, and, and I think, to be honest, one of the reasons why uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen was, was keen to push this, the United States is being left behind. The, the UK already has a digital tax. France already has a digital tax. Italy is preparing a digital tax. In other words, companies are going it alone because we haven't come up with a global solution. Now, that is not efficient. A global solution is going to be more efficient than having sort of this spaghetti bowl of complicated taxes all around the world. You know, it's going to be easier for companies to know, OK, these are the standards that we have to meet. Um, so I think the fact that, that we've gone towards the least preferred solution already but we've only just started going down that route. That's an incentive to actually come up with a sensible global solution. The caveat to this is that it's all very well having a global minimum tax rate, but the problem is the loopholes. And this was always the case in the United States. The US has got the highest corporate tax rate in the world. No, it didn't. I mean, the US had so many loopholes in its corporate tax rate, the effective tax rate was comparable to half the countries of Europe. Um, but you just had to have the right lawyer and accountant to find the loopholes. That was always the problem. So it's not efficient. Um, but that becomes the question with the global minimum corporate tax rate, I think. Um, that if Ireland says, no, no, OK, the global minimum tax rate is 21%. Unless your grandmother came from Donegal, in which case you get a special discount um, or, you know, whatever it's going to be. And you come up with these loopholes. That's not helpful. So you need uh, uh, the idea of a global corporate minimum tax rate. I think that's that's the, actually the simple part to come up with. The complicated part is how do you make sure that you don't get the loopholes and the evasions coming through? And how do you deal with that if it does happen? That's where the complexity arises. But I think there is some momentum towards this at the moment. Interesting. Um, just turning now to the sort of the, the British economist here on the, on the call, um, Paul, and, and sort of Brexit um, 
big, big uh, development. You know, it's been nearly, what, 100 days now, I think, since the Brexit uh, implementation. Um, hopes for a post-Brexit relationship with the EU seem to be a little, you know, shaky. Uh, the British exporters aren't really all that happy right now. And I was reading, I think Amsterdam have now just ousted uh, London as the largest financial trading center in Europe um, uh, since these Brexit uh, movements. So what are your thoughts are there? I mean, is it a net long term? Is it a net negative or a net positive for the UK? Uh, so Amsterdam is, is the largest trader for European shares. So European right. shares used to be traded in London. Now they're traded in Amsterdam predominantly. Um, London's still the largest financial center. Um, the and actually that's sort of indicative of of the whole brexit process the uk's lost a bit europe's also lost i mean europe's lost as well um putting up barriers is never a good idea and we've put up barriers so you could argue that there are offsets and there are offsets to this um uh, support for brexit has actually risen since it happened in the uk that I think has got very little to do with the experience of Brexit, an awful lot to do with the experience of the vaccine regime, um, where the UK had a, a system which, being in the EU, wouldn't EU wouldn't necessarily have meant that we couldn't pursue this, but it was certainly made it a lot more complicated. And the EU's initial handling of vaccine was shambolic. It has to be said the EU is now vaccinating at the same rate that the US is, a little bit behind the UK, but same rate as the US. So it's 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 picked up in the last couple of months, but it was shambolic. Um, ultimately, the, the, the issue, I think, with something like Brexit is both sides are going to be worse off in terms of GDP over the next decade. But does the person in the street realise that? Probably not. If GDP is 0.2% lower, economists get really worked up about this. But you know, ordinary people are not going to notice that GDP is 0.2% lower. Specific industries will notice, and we've become less efficient. But even then, there's, a, there's an element of adaptation. So my brother works, um, runs his own business in retail. He's been complaining about, oh, you know, the paperwork I have to do in order to get you know, imports or exports done, which I never used to have to do. And yes, it's an inconvenience. But it means he spends two hours a weekend not watching spy, Sky Sports and doing paperwork. Well, yes, it's inefficient, but he's still doing it. Business is still taking place. So there are some, some limits here. So I think it's a negative. Um, I would say that once you move beyond about 10 years, it honestly, it stops being relevant. Because again, what I'm interested in on a 10 year view is how well do you adapt to structural change, mm -hmm. not you know, what's going on with Brexit. You, you'll adapt. People do adapt over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I still think it's made us a less efficient global economy, a less efficient European economy, but we'll adapt to it over time. Uh, to be honest, I think that, that perhaps some of the political issues are more significant here than has been the case in the past. So one negative for the UK is we, during the pandemic, we lost a lot of migrant workers. Uh, immigrant workers tend to be more productive than the local population in, in any society. Um, they were very helpful to the UK economy. They may come back, but the combination of the pandemic and Brexit meant that you know, the, the, they went back to Poland or uh, generally Eastern European workers. Um, and that is a loss of, of labour that you know, I hope will come back, but is perhaps less likely to post-Brexit. Um, Europe has changed politically as well. Um, the UK and Germany used to ally very closely um, on economic issues, not on foreign policy issues, but on, on economic issues, and were a very, very powerful force in Europe. And the two are generally free market, uh, very supportive of free trade. You, the, the UK with German support led the World Trade Organization's creation, for example, and, and promoting free trade. Um, with the loss of the UK, and actually now with the loss of um, uh, Angela Merkel, or the, the imminent loss of Angela Merkel as chancellor in Germany, um, the balance of power in Europe has shifted away from Berlin, which is where it was centered, um, initially towards Paris. So there was a, a, a stronger French accent coming through. Um, that can be good or bad, depending on your point of view. Uh, the French think it's good. 
others might disagree. Um, now I would say actually the balance of power is shifting towards Rome because of purely because of Mario Draghi and because Macron is in a weakened position. But again, the fact that the UK no longer has a seat at the table has given you a more Southern European tone to economic policy in Europe. Mm. Europe is uh, arguably the most important consumer market in the world. Um, in terms of middle class consumers, it's got more than the United States, far more than China ever has. Um, and Europe is increasingly setting a lot of regulation around consumer products, for example. Um, that shift in power might be quite significant, um, not just to, to you know, what goes on in the continent of Europe, but what goes on globally. Because, for example, a lot of Asian countries adopt European standards simply because it's easier to do. The UK is having to adopt what European standards there are, um, and the nature of those standards has shifted. Gosh, I hadn't thought of Southern Europe uh, shifting towards Southern Europe. That's interesting. Um, Paul, you wrote a book about profit and prejudice. Um, and what's the basic premise of the book? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Um, so, as I said, you know, we, we're embarking on the fourth industrial revolution, and this is a this is a period of significant upheaval. Um, the point about an industrial revolution. It's not about, oh, we're going to raise GDP by 0.3, 0 0.4%. It's nothing like that. You're turning the world upside down. Some people's income and status will go up. Some people's income and status will go down. Society changes. What's fascinating about the fourth industrial revolution is that in many ways, we're reversing the first industrial revolution, the social change, not the economics of it, but the social structures. So before the first industrial revolution, um, people worked at home. They were self-employed. Um, uh, and you know you would uh, have all of your goods made locally and, and your food would come locally and so on and so forth. And then the first industrial revolution comes along and you, you move to a dark satanic mill in Manchester and you know, you're, you're no longer working from home and you're working regimented shift times, you change education demand, food has to be brought in from outside. Believe me, nothing grows in Manchester. You've got to bring it all in from outside. All of this changes and you're up, up changing everything. And now, we're going back now. Here am I working from home, buying from the local shop, you know, growing my own food in the garden. I mean, you know, you've, you've shifted back in some ways. So we've got a really big set of structural change. How do we win? You win by having the right person in the right job at the right time. I don't care about technology. Ask not who makes your smartphone. Ask what your smartphone can do for you. That's the critical thing. What is it you are using the technology for? That's how you succeed. But how do you make the most out of technology? By employing the right people. That's absolutely critical. So for me, the focus of the next 10 to 20 years is, if you'll forgive the hideous economic term, it's the human capital. It's the skills, the experience, the talents of the people, and the ability to employ the right people. That's what really, really matters. Here's the problem. Prejudice guarantees you do not employ the right people because prejudice is saying, yes, you're absolutely perfect for the job. You are the right person for this job at this moment in time, but you're a woman and we don't really employ women. Or I don't like your ethnicity or you've got a foreign accent. We're not having that. That's irrational prejudice and it is extraordinarily economically destructive. And the problem that we have in a period of structural upheaval is that there is a natural bias for prejudice to rise. Because what we find is, as I said, some people do better, some people do worse. Um, if you're doing worse, you've been turning up to your job every day, you've done your job to the very best of your ability, and all of a sudden you lose your job. Now you've lost your job because of complicated forces in the world, um, because you know, you're department store is no longer relevant in a world where people are going online and people are going online because it's convenient and so on and so on. But you don't see those complex forces. You want a simple solution. And the simple solution is it's not my fault I lost my job. That person took it from me. That immigrant came in and stole my job. That ethnic minority has undermined society and taken my job. Or you know, the moral code has collapsed because um, LGBTQ plus people are, are wandering around. Whatever it is, you pick on a minority. And that gives you two advantages. 
from your perspective. Firstly, you have a simple solution. If only we sort out the problem of that minority, I'll go back to this mythical golden age of the past, restorative nostalgia, it's called. And secondly, you get the chance to feel a bit superior. You feel part of a group, yet we're better than them and we deserve the job. And of course, that, that appeals to people's egos, particularly when you've just been dragged down by forces beyond your control. Scapegoat economics has happened in every single industrial revolution. First industrial revolution, it was the Catholics and uh, Presbyterians. Second industrial revolution, it was immigrants and the Jewish population. Third industrial revolution, it was women in the workforce. Every industrial revolution, a group has been targeted and it prevents you having the right person in the right job at the right time. It deliberately undermines the uh, potential for success. And I think because what is happening now is so dependent on human capital, prejudice has become so much more damaging um, at a corporate level and at a social level. Um, we are going to see prejudice rising. I'm afraid it's an inevitable consequence of upheaval. It's not something we should desire. It's, it is something that's going to happen. The more we can keep that in check, the more likely we are to reap the significant gains that the fourth industrial revolution can present. Paul, our time is nearly up. We've got about seven minutes to go. And I know one theme <clears throat> that is on the minds of certainly many of our students at the business school is this whole area of cryptocurrency and, and so on, and that moving into the mainstream. And of course, you know, we've seen the recent, you know, direct listing of Coinbase, uh, the monster of a company. Um, we even have one of our benefactors who endowed our law school, uh, Rick Caruso, is apparently now accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment for his tenants. A <laughs> um, couple of thoughts. I know this is not a favorite topic for a banker, but uh, can you share a couple of thoughts on the future of Bitcoin and crypto? Well, um, were crypto to be a currency, it would be an enormous benefit for banks, for wealth managers like UBS because the, the repeated bouts of hyperinflation, clients would come flooding to us in desperation. But it's not a currency and it never will be. Um, on that, I am absolutely certain. Um, uh, Bitcoin in the last week, uh, was it last weekend? The weekend before last, um, saw a, a, a sudden drop in its spending power, um, which was the equivalent of hyperinflation. In fact, the loss of spending power in the course of 24 hours was worse than anything experienced during Weimar's hyperinflation in Germany in 1923. Wow. Um, you, you can't have something where all of a sudden, within 24 hours, your spending power declines by 15%. That's, that doesn't work as a currency. And the reason why you get these abrupt drops in spending power is because there is a fatal flaw with something like Bitcoin, which is... The supply can go up, crypto supply as a, as a group can go up indefinitely, but it can't go down. You can't reduce the supply. And of course, with fiat currency, that's exactly what happens. So last August, there was a decline in demand for dollar liquidity um, related to international demand for dollars. Uh, it was a technical issue around swap lines. And the Fed reduced the supply of dollars and the dollar maintained its spending power. Um, what we saw over the weekend was a sudden drop in demand for Bitcoin and the spending power of Bitcoin fell in lockstep with it. So that's a really, really big problem. Um, so I don't see them having a future as currencies. That doesn't mean that crypto doesn't have a role in the future. I think tokenization is extremely important and there are other ways that, that um, digital assets can and will play a significant role in the future. But it's not going to be as a currency. Uh, and that I am absolutely certain of. Um, the other aspect that is increasingly coming in around crypto, some crypto, Bitcoin is, is the leading example of these problems, is that it really seems to be missing the zeitgeist of, of you know, the, the 21st century. What do I mean by that? So what is the, 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 the tone of the current environment? We are focused on sustainability. Bitcoin is not only environmentally destructive, it is increasingly environmentally destructive. The more you use it, the more you create it, the more damage you do to the environment over time. This is not good. Um, you can buy carbon offsets. Carbon offsets are not helping sustainability. 
carbon offsets is you know committing a sin and then trying to repent you shouldn't be committing the sin in environmental sustainability terms you have got to become progressively less damaging to the environment bitcoin by definition will become progressively more damaging to the environment we are looking at a world where democracy becomes more important um crypto is not democratic it's plutocratic you know, it's one bitcoin one vote not one person one vote it's a slight simplification but it's a plutocratic concept um it increases wealth inequality uh, most crypto particularly again bitcoin is concentrated in the hands of an infinitesimally small number of people um you know, this is not egalitarian sharing wealth uh, and one of the other issues uh, more about application of this as a currency is it's not inclusive because in order to have access to crypto you need to be uh, having access to the internet having access to uh, digital technology the digital divide is actually a big issue because who tends to be uh, restricted in their access uh, to digital technology older people uh, ethnic minorities generally speaking lower income people those groups are being excluded this has been a huge issue in sweden for example not with crypto but with general digital currency because we all have digital currency um, it's just held in banks and sweden has been contemplating getting rid of cash you know abolishing physical cash like, i haven't seen a swedish krona note in years the rich banks say well why don't we get rid of it and the answer is because about 15 percent of the population don't have access to digital money um, you know, they don't have online access and so forth and you would be cutting 15 percent of po the population out of the economy well crypto is the same sort of thing it's because it's digitally based and there isn't a, a non-digital alternative it's very damaging so i think that there is a lot that can be done with digital assets and tokenization and so forth crypto as a currency fails it's it's not going to work um it's not a stable store of value it, it's design flaw is is there um just because you limit the supply of an individual crypto does not guarantee a store of value uh, anybody who thinks that limiting supply guarantees a store of value should google beanie babies and you will uh, find out that that is not necessarily the case cool uh our, our time is unfortunately up i have many more questions and i saw a number of questions turning up in the chat box that regrettably we're just not able to get to I also want to thank one of our alums, uh, Geoffroy Dubusson in Luxembourg, who was able to put us in contact with you and make the introduction. Uh, thank you, Geoffroy. We really appreciate that. And it's been so insightful, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking an hour in your early evening uh, to be with us. We're honored to have someone of your expertise and eloquence uh, share with us today. And uh, I'm sure there'll be many more downstream conversations as a result within the school uh, based on some of your comments and, and insights. So, but our time is up. Uh, thank you for joining and uh, wish you uh, great success and hope that we can all meet in person at some point in the future. But uh, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak and, right. uh, and for such a lively debate. So thank you. Excellent. God bless. Bye-bye now. Thank you.